Hello everyone, I'm Megan Sullivan and welcome to my tips and tricks for beginners video for Fire Emblem Engage, developed by Intelligent Systems and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo Switch. I think Fire Emblem Engage is pretty beginner friendly, thanks to its clear tutorials and clean user interface, but I know Fire Emblem games in general can feel a little overwhelming, so I thought it would be nice to share some easy tips and tricks with you that have helped me in my Fire Emblem journey. So the first piece of advice I have may seem a little obvious, but I can't stress it enough. Make sure to pay attention to the weapons triangle, a rock paper system mechanic where weapons have different strengths and weaknesses against other weapons. This is an important mechanic in Fire Emblem and if you respect this feature it will help you achieve victory or survive a brutal encounter. Plus it has an extra advantage in Fire Emblem Engage. If you attack an enemy with the right type of weapon, you'll trigger the break effect and the enemy will no longer be able to counterattack for the rest of your turn. This means you can have your team safely do follow-up attacks until the enemy is defeated. So the rule is swords are strong against axes, axes are strong against lances, lances are strong against swords, bows are strong against flying units, magic is strong against heavily armored units, and martial arts are strong against bows, magic tomes, and daggers. Meanwhile, daggers can inflict poison, and staves can not only heal characters, but can impair enemy actions and move units quickly and efficiently around the battle map in order to either get the drop on an adversary or get out of their way. Okay, all of that may seem like a lot to remember, but don't worry, not only can you pause the action to review the weapons triangle in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, the game also includes visual cues that appear above an enemy's head to indicate whether you can trigger the break effect, if you can, you'll see a red circle with a slash through it, or if your unit is particularly vulnerable to an enemy's attack. If they are, you'll see an exclamation point. By the way, if you see red arching lines or an ominous black line pointing towards one of your units while moving them around the battle map, it means they're within range of an enemy attack, so be careful. If you're not sure which units and which weapons to bring into battle, you can do a quick scan of the battlefield before you start the fight. Just go to swap spaces in the pre-battle menu and move the cursor around the battle map. The user interface will tell you everything you need to know about the lay of the land and the enemies occupying it, which will give you a good idea of who and what to bring to a fight as well as where to place your troops for maximum effect. Another good tip for deciding who to bring into battle is to look at an individual unit's personal skill and class skill. Some personal skills and class skills may be extra useful in certain battle situations, so it's good to pay attention to these features. Which reminds me, later in the game you'll be able to buy Master Seals and Second Seals, which will help a character become even more powerful in battle. Master Seals are used to change a unit's base class into a more advanced class, which will give a unit access to some of the best skills and abilities in the game. Meanwhile, Second Seals change a unit's vocation altogether, so they can learn a different skill set. Also, once you max out a job, you can use a Second Seal to reset a character's vocation level without losing their stats, so they can stay in the job class they prefer, but continue to grow stronger. At first, these seals are hard to come by, but don't worry, they pop up more frequently in later chapters of the game, so you don't have to hoard them and can use them right away, which you'll want to do to gain an advantage in battle. But even with careful planning and access to the best skills in the game, you still may find yourself in a pinch, especially as more advanced enemies tend to call in hidden reserves halfway through a fight. Don't worry though, there are some ways to counteract this. First of all, equip a combat unit with at least two different weapon types that they're proficient in, so they can quickly switch between them if they find themselves up against an enemy with a possible weapon advantage. Also, if there's room in a unit's inventory, bring a throwing weapon. They can help chip away at an enemy's health while keeping them at bay. And if you have a unit that specializes in one type of weapon category, like a swordmaster, it might be a good idea to equip that unit with a variety of the same weapon, as different types of the same weapon can do extra damage to very specific and dangerous foes. For example, a Worven sword is effective against dragons, so if you see a dragon on the battlefield, be sure to have a Worven sword handy. But what if a dragon suddenly appears halfway through a fight and you weren't expecting that so you didn't bring a Worven sword? Fear not, there's a way to fix this too. Whenever you find yourself in a situation where you don't have what you need, go ahead and take full advantage of the convoy and trade features in the combat menu. To access a convoy, which is where all your unequipped items are stored, simply place a battle unit next to the divine dragon and they'll be able to access a convoy and grab whatever item they need. Units can also trade equipped items with each other if they're standing next to each other on the battlefield, which is also handy. I can't tell you how many times convoy and trade help me out in a tight spot. Speaking of spots, be sure to make use of special terrain tiles scattered throughout the battlefield. Some will increase your avoidance, meaning it will be harder for enemies to hit your units, and others will heal your characters, which is useful in a tough fight. Conversely, be careful not to place units on quicksand tiles or tiles that are on fire. By the way, if you're connected to the internet while playing, you might see spaces that have pink or gold swirls called Spirits of the Fallen on them, which means there are items or experience points to collect on that tile, so feel free to stand on those whenever it's safe to do so. 
And finally, before we move on from battle, let's talk about emblem rings and bond rings. Don't forget to equip these before battle. Not only do they give your characters a stat boost and special perks, they earn you skill points, which are used to unlock special emblem ring skills known as inherited skills. We'll talk about what that means later, but for now, just know that you can only earn skill points by wearing a ring and participating in battles, so make sure every character is wearing a ring in combat. Now let's talk about the difference between emblem rings and bond rings. Emblem rings, which you'll acquire throughout the story are really great because they not only give characters a big stat boost, they allow that unit to summon a legendary Fire Emblem hero into battle, which will give a character access to that hero's unique skills, as well as their most powerful attacks and abilities once a character engages with them. FYI, to trigger the engage mechanic, you have to fill up a special meter by attacking enemies. To fill up the meter faster, you can either equip characters with a passive ability that hurries the process along, or simply stand on a special blue terrain tile called Emblem Energy that will immediately max out an engage meter. Now I know it might be tempting to have an ally immediately engage with a hero as soon as it can, but you want to save these temporary overdrive attacks for the strongest enemies on the field, which are generally the Four Hounds, a powerful group of antagonists whom you'll run into again and again and again. They're very scary and the best way to defeat them quickly is to have a character engage with a hero and then hit them with your best shot. So go ahead, fire away. By the way, if you find yourself unsure about which emblem ring to pair with which unit, one easy way is to just look and see if a character will earn bonuses if they equip the ring. These bonus types indicate the ring and the character's job class are well suited for one another. The more bonus types triggered, the more compatible the two are. Also, the more a character wears an emblem ring, the higher their bond level with that hero will be, which will not only unlock even more unique skills and stronger abilities, but will also unlock new weapon proficiencies, allowing a character to wield multiple types of weapons in battle, so it's definitely worth pairing the right unit with the right emblem ring. Just be sure to swap out rings once a character maxes out their ring's bond level, so they can continue acquiring new skills from new emblem heroes. So now we know how useful emblem rings are, but what about bond rings? I think these may be overlooked by some people because they're not as powerful as emblem rings and don't offer the same type of mechanics, but they're still pretty important because it can offer good stat boosts and special perks. But how do you even get a bond ring? Well, this is a good opportunity to segue into the Somniel, so let's do that. The Somniel is your general headquarters in the game, and it's here where you'll be doing extracurricular activities in order to gain an advantage in battle. There's lots of things you can do here, so let's review them in order of importance. The first thing you want to do when you arrive on the Somniel is visit the arena. Training a combat unit at the arena will allow them to earn extra experience points and skill points. This is a good way to get bench units up to speed. You can also have a character spar with an emblem hero in order to increase their bond level without actually having to wear their ring. So be sure to visit the arena every time you visit the Somniel. Once you're finished at the arena, immediately head over to the ring chamber. It's here where characters can create and meld bond rings, inherit a hero's skills and abilities, augment a hero's legendary weapons, and further increase a unit's bond level with a hero by polishing their ring. Okay, this last mechanic is kind of stupid, and you probably don't need to do it every time you visit the ring chamber. Just keep an eye on how happy or sad a hero is and polish the ring when needed. The other activities, however, are super important, so don't skip out on these. The first activity you should focus on is creating and melding together bond rings. To do this, you need to spend a special type of currency you acquire on and off the battlefield called bond fragments. Since there are 10 unique bond rings associated with each of the 12 emblem heroes, you can create 120 unique bond rings altogether. Luckily, you can create 10 rings at a time, so on paper, it's not too tedious. Unfortunately though, the process is randomized, so you may end up getting duplicates of the same bond ring. But the good news is that since bond rings have a letter rank, you can meld them together to get a better version of that ring, which will offer better stats and sometimes even a combat perk. Still, it's a random roll each time, so if you're looking for a particular ring to duplicate, you may have to roll again. There are ways to cheat the system a little, but it's a bit of a complicated process, so I'm not going to cover it here. Let's move on to the Inherit Skills feature. Remember how I said earning skill points is really important? Well, this is why. By spending skill points, you can inherit certain skills and abilities from an emblem hero that allows a unit to access these skills without having to wear their ring in battle. It's a great feature, and it's fun to mix and match different skills with different characters and different job classes. You can only inherit skills if a unit is at bond level 5 or above, however, and you can only equip two skills at a time, so keep that in mind. How do you decide which skills a character should inherit? Well, the best way to figure it out is to take a look at a character's job class 
class, the type of weapons they use, their individual stats, and their personal skills. Then equip the inherited skills you think enhance those features the most. I know, that's a little vague, but with 12 emblem rings, up to 36 characters to recruit, and tons of different job classes, there are lots of possibilities here, so just use your best judgment. And finally, it's in the ring chamber where you can augment an emblem hero's cache of legendary weapons, but for that you need special currency called Banes and Crystals, which can only be earned at the Tower of Trials, located in a separate part of the Somniel. We'll return to the Tower of Trials in a bit, but for now, let's leave the ring chamber. Okay, now it's time to visit the blacksmith. There you can improve a weapon's stats by either refining the weapon using different types of ore or engraving a weapon, which will allow you to increase a weapon's stats by tapping into the power of an emblem ring. Don't neglect to upgrade your weapons, because even a simple iron sword can turn into a powerful tool with enough refinement. And if you refine a weapon enough, you may unlock the ability to turn it into a rare weapon, which in turn can be refined to make it more powerful. Know, however, that upgrading a weapon is expensive. The process costs gold, different types of ore, and in the case of engravings, bond fragments, the latter of which are also needed to create and meld together bond rings or spar with an emblem hero at the arena. So how do you quickly acquire currency in Fire Emblem Engage? If you need extra cash, one way to earn it is to bring Anna along to a fight, which reminds me, be sure to hit up any paralogue battles you see on the world map, as you can sometimes find recruitable characters there, like Anna. Anna's personal skill, Make a Killing, allows her to earn 500 gold if she defeats an enemy in battle. The skill is based on a percentage of her luck, so the higher her luck, the higher her chances are of making you money. Gold can also be earned by visiting the world map and participating in skirmishes where enemies will drop gold in battle. Another way to earn money is to do paralogue trials for different Fire Emblem heroes, which you should do anyway to unlock their maximum bond level. Keep in mind these encounters are pretty tough, so be sure your team is ready for anything. And of course, you can always sell items you don't need at the Somniel's item shop, but be careful with this too. You never know when you're going to need a torch or an antitoxin in battle. Okay, so now you have gold, but what about the ore you need to refine weapons? Good question. There are a couple ways to acquire it. One is to visit the Somniel's flea market and buy it, but it's pretty expensive and also pretty rare. The main way to acquire it is during or after a battle. That's easy enough to understand, but finding enough ore can be a problem. In order to increase your chances of finding lots of ore on the battlefield, you need to go to the cafe on the Somniel and donate money to one of the four kingdoms you visit throughout your journey. It's a pain to do this because money can be scarce and engage, but donating a little bit of money at a time can help ease the pain of investing in a country. And finally, let's talk about how to earn bond fragments. Luckily, this is by far the easiest currency to stock up on. You can pick them up in battle. You can pick them up after battle. You can get them by talking to your companions. You can collect them by walking around the Somniel. You can earn them by playing a mini game that looks like a cheap knockoff of Kid Icarus Uprising. You can earn them by visiting the message board at the cafe in Somniel and cashing in your achievements. You can earn them by fishing, or petting and feeding this thing that hangs out in the Somniel Grotto. Sometimes pets you've adopted will drop them. There's no shortage of ways to earn bond fragments, so don't worry about these. Okay, so now you've visited the blacksmith and refined your weapons. Where to next? Well, you might want to visit the Tower of Trials, so you can earn those veins and crystals needed to augment emblem hero weapons. The Tower of Trials offers three unique game modes to participate in, one offline and two online. First are Tempest Trials, where you attempt to clear multiple battle maps at a time. Then there are Relay Trials, where you and a friend try to clear a battle map together. And finally Outrealm Trials, where you pit your best units against another person's best units on custom-made maps. I admit I didn't have much luck connecting with another person for the Relay Trials, and I found Tempest Trials difficult and laborious. But Outrealm Trials were kind of fun, so there's that. At any rate, once you get enough Banes and Crystals, you can return to the Ring Chamber and augment whichever hero weapons you want, as long as you have enough of the right type of Bane crystal. But by now we're feeling hungry, so let's gather some delicious ingredients and visit the Somniel Cafe for a nice stat-boosting meal. You can gather ingredients by visiting the Somniel's orchard, fishing at the local pond, picking up any ingredients dropped by animals you've adopted, or buying them at the flea market. Sometimes they're just lying around the Somniel. Keep in mind that different meals offer different stat boosts, and a meal being made successfully depends on whoever is on chef duty for the day, so make sure to match the right type of meal with the right chef. If you do, you'll not only get a temporary stat boost before battle, you'll also be given leftovers, which when eaten in combat restores a big chunk of health. Also, a successful meal will increase your support rank with individual units, which will open up ranked conversations, allowing your divine dragon to get closer to those units, who will then offer combat perks if the Divine Dragon stands next to them in battle. 
Another way to increase support levels between the Divine Dragon and their followers is to offer gifts to people. So whenever you find a gift lying around or see them available at the flea market, be sure to grab a couple of them. But if that's too difficult or expensive, just stand next to the unit you like in battle. They'll appreciate the closeness. This latter rule applies to all units actually, and if you want to enhance the amount of support characters give each other, be sure to visit the fortune telling hut at night and the dancer Seedal will tell you which characters should stand next to each other in combat to get a boost in their support level. This is only available starting in chapter 15 though, so just be aware. By the way, to change the time of day on the Somniel, you can visit your bedroom and sleep the hours away. Just know that at some point a random character will come to wake you up and it's really creepy. To shake off that unpleasant experience, hit the gym, I mean training area, where you can participate in mini games that can give your divine dragon a quick stat boost before battle. I found these mini games super annoying, but that tiny stat boost can make a real difference in combat, so don't entirely neglect your physical health. And finally, you can go to the records hall and edit your profile card, look at a friend's card, and even stage photo shoots with your allies. To take a better photo, visit the clothes shop to play dress up with your friends, although honestly, I wouldn't waste my money doing this unless you're pretty rich. Okay, this video is running a little long, so I think I'll stop here, as I just wanted to cover a few basic tips and tricks for Fire Emblem Engage. I hope they're useful, and if you have some tips and tricks of your own, feel free to put them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching guys, see you later!